In a funny way, they're not just movies to me. It was a way of expressing emotion and a way of learning a little about life. You need to know how ideas and emotions are expressed through a visual form. The certain tools you use and those tools uh, become part of a vocabulary that's just as valid as that vocabulary that, that is used in literature. I mean, in cinema, we're working with subtleties. There's a curtain that, that blows a certain way in the frame and an actor shifts his eyes a certain way. There had to be an emotional connection to the material and to the characters. Um, the obsessiveness of Travis Bickle, the sense of being the outsider and not being the dispossessed. That's how, I, you know, we felt that way. But over the years, I was more drawn to um, the films that I, that I constantly revisited or, or saw repeatedly uh, held up longer for me over the years, um, not because of plot, but because of character and um, a very different approach to story. In the process of making the picture, I tried to learn about myself, learn about life. Uh, we try to find the truth in those things and uh, because the truth is is uh, enjoyable and painful and uh, a lot of fun you know but i think what what we're really talking about is that, uh, it's not just movies that they're not just movies to me they're in many respects uh having had asthma my father taking me to the, to the movie theater yeah. constantly because he couldn't i couldn't play sports or anything he never really talked to me very much when i was a kid and so that was a way of talking that was a way of of experiencing strong emotional, whether it, was, whether it was Kirk Douglas and Lana Turner in The Bad and the Beautiful, or it was James Mason in The Desert Fox, or it was uh, uh, On the Town, or American in Paris, uh, you know, any of these things. It was a way of experiencing emotion, of feelings. If I wanted to say I loved you to him, which I didn't, it was yeah. through that film, you see. Yeah. And the same way with him to me. And my mother, to, to, to a certain extent also, my older brother, too. And so, in a funny way, they're not just movies to me. It was a way of expressing emotion and a way of learning a little about life and uh, using these as examples um, of how to live. A, <laughs> you can't take, uh, I mean, not every film, what I, what I mean by that is that it's like, um, it becomes about life. Uh, the pictures I make, I'm talking about, it becomes about the fact that yes, I adore these old movies and everything, because I can never make them. Uh, I wish I could have, but I, I not, I'm, I'm what I am, I do what I do now. And in the process of making the picture, I tried to learn about myself, learn about life, and it, uh, uh, we try to find the truth in those things, and uh, because the truth is is uh, enjoyable and painful and uh, a lot of fun. I mean, in cinema, we're working with subtleties. There's a curtain that that blows a certain way in the frame, and an actor shifts his eyes a certain way. Another one does something that's unexpected with her hands. Let's say there are silences, pauses, thoughts, even shivers. You know, the great silent uh, film master F. W. Murnau. Uh, once said that uh, in cinema we were dealing with, quote, uh, the most fleeting harmonies of atmosphere, unquote. So atmosphere is very important. That includes sound, huh? And we're dealing with human events in that atmosphere, with being in the frame, how a person moves and changes. There's nothing generic about a close-up or a long shot because every take is really distinct and completely different on its own. What do you do when you, when you change how the world thinks of cinema what's next i mean uh, um do you keep making the same kind of film or if you're a person like rossellini uh, uh if you are uh, you try something experimental you push further it's not just experimental for experiment experiment's sake but you push the boundaries further i I kind of think as an editor myself, really, when I make pictures. I'm planning a film, I'm seeing it come together in my mind, um, but I'm, whenever that happens, I'm really thinking more of the flow of images, juxtaposition of images, actually the cuts, really, now one affects the other. I kind of anticipate a feeling of uh, wonder and excitement that I always have whenever I go into the editing room. I have this excitement about seeing and feeling what happens when you take one image and another image, not the same, uh, but you put the two together and it creates some sort of sensation, a kind of uh, spark. But really, these two disparate images spliced together create what I like to call a, a, a phantom image, which is in the mind's eye. Emotion, psychology, political, you make your point through that cut, in a sense. Having said that, you could take 
I don't know, you could take that same cut, and you could remove one frame at the tail of the first shot and add two frames on the tail of the second, and it's a completely different uh, sensation, a completely different phantom image in the mind is created. And that's the mystery and uh, the beauty of uh, really the heart of cinema for me. It's always what has compelled me to make pictures and always will be what compels me to make a film. You know, people always say, well, interested in the antagonist in my movies. Well, the point is that they're also human. And these are also parts of the negative parts of who they are. Uh, evil streak, so to speak, if you want to use that phrase, is also maybe something in us and something not to be afraid of but to explore. A lot of his films, and especially with Goodfellas, definitely deal in the underworld. And that's been a, a recurring theme in a lot of his work. And I think people are attracted to that, but more so the fact that he's always trying to grasp the humanity of these people, the flawed nature of these characters. I think they just reflect aspects of who we are as human beings and some things we can't deny or pretend they don't exist. That's the idea. That's very dangerous because when it, if you're teaching younger people, when they suddenly shock to find out it does exist, no, it exists. You know, I just want to get you prepared. I don't know how it's going to come at you, but it's going to be there because that's part of who we are. One has to begin to, I think, reach younger people at an earlier age for them to, to um, shape their minds to, to, in a critical way, a critical way of looking at these images and what they mean and how to interpret imagery. Um, and I think um, in a more official way, I think, uh, than, than uh, uh, just punching up on a computer or uh, seeing something on uh, uh, a TV commercial or something like that. I think, it really, I think you really need to know, you need to know how ideas and emotions are expressed through a visual form. You know, I come from a working class family. My mother and father weren't well educated. Um, um, I was second generation, I guess, uh, Italian-American. Um, and uh, there, were, they, there was no tradition of reading in the house, no books. Um, of course, I read in school, et cetera, books in school and that sort of thing. But there, it was more of a visual tradition, more uh, if uh, I was taken to movie theaters a lot. So it was mainly, mainly uh, um, visual literacy what was, was what was happening at, at that time to me. I did not understand that that was happening. What it made me realize was that there was an intelligence, another kind of intelligence, that was trying to tell a story through where the director, the writer, and the cinematographer, where they were focusing your eyes. You know, whether it was a, the camera may be on an extremely low angle, looking up at you. Um, uh, the use of the lens, the size of the lens, I began to understand certain lenses did, did interpreted the story differently. Uh, a longer lens crushed everything together and made it flat. A wider lens stretched everything and some don't distort it. Uh, but I was beginning to understand that the certain tools you use and those tools uh, become part of a vocabulary that's just as valid as that vocabulary that, that is used in literature. And uh, so film is very powerful. Images are very powerful, I should say, and we have to start to begin to teach younger people how to use them and what they, and at least to begin to understand, to interpret them. Do you want to be famous? Did you want to be? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. And yeah. did all that generation of people that I, you I, met I, then, I, uh, yes, Spielberg and Schrader did. and... We all did. I mean, um, when I was at NYU, I know I was a director. I was making a living editing somewhat other people's films and, and documentaries and things like that. I was making a living also doing a little bit of writing, but basically, no, I, I felt I was a director and I, I knew I was, but other people didn't take me that seriously. And um, I went, I was shameless. I went to every party in LA, I promoted myself shamelessly. Um, make your own industry. Recreate movies. Don't pay attention to industry. Do your own thing. I mean, put it this way. Um, you want the work to be seen. But it doesn't have to be at the Odeon, you know, no more. That's all different. That's all gone. It's another ancient world. That type of film, or not even that type of film, the, the, the communal experience is always important. You can make a film on a, a camera the size of that doorknob and still show it to uh, 1,600 people in an audience. It's still a great communal experience, you know. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to cost uh, uh, over 100 million pounds. 
you know. It's all new. You just break it open. Break open the form. Don't just, uh, just you know, have your tripod and a, a camera that's standing on it. Uh, the cameras that are being made now, and of course the fact that all Ari Ariflex and, and other cameras have stopped being made, and whether we uh, like it or not, we have to deal with a new, f a new technology, a high definition, or digital, whatever it's called. It's, it, it changes cinematography, the art of cinematography, but, it, but you younger ones, you make a new art. Take what's available, push it, you know. Because it's going to go there. You could do anything. When you, you must see lots of scripts. When a script comes across your desk and you, uh, you look at it, what, what's the hallmark of a great script? How do you know you, you want to choose that one over the thousands of or hundreds of others that you look at? What pops um, out at you? Uh, personal, a personal, I usually, I don't read other people's scripts. And I usually develop something or um, I have something in mind and I work with a friend, usually in uh, some cases Nick Pelleggi, in other cases Jay Cox. And, uh, or hire Paul Schrader for uh, bringing out the dead. But when, he, for example, when Taxi Driver was given to me to read by Brian De Palma, um, I hadn't done Mean Streets yet, and so, but he said, you'd be great for this. And automatically, I mean, there had to be an emotional connection to the material and to the characters. Um, the obsessive mess of Travis Bickle, the sense of being the outsider and not being the dispossessed. That's how, I, you know, we felt that way. I mean, myself, and I, I can speak for De Niro to a certain extent because we didn't articulate it that way. I can't really say, oh, you know, we're outsiders. We were trying to get in. But very, we were trying to stay in Hollywood. Goodfellas was very special. I was looking for something that uh, I could find another way of dealing with genre. And I think really that's what started to get me really interested in it, the characters in the world that it depicted in a genre that I've kind of felt most comfortable with over the years. There's something about the underworld it has more to do with a kind of uh, a working class or lower working class existence from where I come from, and so it's natural for me. That world is something that deals with very basic conflicts, uh, basic uh, dilemmas, moral dilemmas, that I grew up with, and so I feel comfortable with it. There's something about De Niro who understands the humanity of all kinds of people and could really uh, express that. Uh, we had same, similar interests. He knew where I came from. I knew where he came from. He, he understood the area I grew up in. And I just think that they reflect those dilemmas, those conflicts. It's kind of comfortable at times to, to do stuff that you feel you intrinsically know. What I mean is know at least in terms of body language, um, dialogue, no dialogue. We shot most of the film in 35 millimeter. Uh, but for the night scenes, we use the Alexa, which is the new eight HD cameras. I mean, they're able to see things, to actually see things that film cameras simply can't. But you kind of take it for granted, I think, uh, because the post is almost infinite. You can, the color, you could do anything with color, light, framing, you could reframe, you could alter speed. Uh, uh, you can alter elements in the same frame, take a character from one take and put them in another take. I imagine how all of this would have felt too. All of this new stuff would have felt to David, David Lean, to King Vidor, Thoral Dickinson. Imagine what they would have done with these tools. All these choices. That's sometimes not a great thing to have all these choices, you know. Limitation is good, often. It really is. Uh, these choices could be infinite. Uh, would the tools have changed their art? Right? Well, yes. In every way, I suppose. I mean, even if it did, and I'm sure it would have, they would have reflected their own time in completely different ways than the films that they made. As filmmakers, we all make use of whatever tools we have. And when we do utilize those tools, we can only really speak in the time in which we live, and we have no choice there. I often think about these questions, and for the younger filmmakers, I know and admire Joachim Trier, and Joanna Hogg, um, Ari Aster, Christy Puyu, and so many others. Uh, in effect, they've had these tools, I believe they've had these tools around them all the time. So how does it feel to them? It's quite different than it does to me, I think. You've said that film, a film can become an obsession with you. Yes. Yeah. And I know that's true. Yeah, yeah. And you said, and so you've lost certain things. Without, being, without meaning to be presumptuous, 
What sacrifices do you think you've made in order to create the work, to make the films, to make the career that you've done? What do you think in your life you've sacrificed? Uh, I think, you know, as a old friend, old priest told me, he said, you pay a price, you know, and you pay a price. Is that, just quite honestly, you know, a personal life, really, and uh, relationships uh, go by the board. I mean, uh, it was as if um, the Frank Capra quote, it's like, being, like a drug or something that you have to continue. And now, as I say, some people call that drive, some call it obsession, some call it just being selfish and being not a very nice person. But the reality is that um, I just had to continue that process. You've made it clear that you're big on story, but not big on plot. And I'd like mm -hmm. you to just talk about the difference between story and plot, if you will. I just found that over the years, I was more drawn to um, the films that I, that I constantly revisited or, or saw repeatedly uh, held up longer for me over the years um, not because of plot, but because of character and um, a very different approach to story, you know? Just, for example, talk about Hitchcock, and we, we um, see his films in the 50s as they came out. Um, Strangers on a Train, Rear Window, all the way up to, uh, uh, you know, Vertigo, uh, North by Northwest, and into Psycho. But I think over the years, the films of, of Hitchcock that I enjoy watching repeatedly uh, the Wrong Man, for example, as a picture that I, I, I've used repeatedly as an example of um, um, mood, paranoid style, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful New York uh, uh, location photography, paranoid camera moves, uh, the feelings of threat. Uh, when, uh, if you know the picture, Henry Fonda has to go to the uh, pay in, uh, paying us insurance uh, in Queens. I, I, was, I, was, I grew up a little bit, I grew up till about seven years old in Queens, so Me too. The, the Jamaica and that whole area. So. It was kind of interesting to see it, but he's, he's standing behind the counter, did, and the woman's looking over, and she, you see Henry Fonda from her point of view, and she thinks he's a robber, because he, he had just robbed this place earlier, and she thinks he's come back. Uh, and the way the camera moves, her perception, excellent, excellent, excellent bit part players, because they could, they could kill you if you don't get the right person. The fear, the anxiety, the paranoia, it's all done through the camera and the person's face. <laughs> I find, I find that that is more interesting to me. So when I, when I, I, I saw Rebecca maybe 10 times, 14 times, and everything, but at a certain point I said, I know, there's no, for me, the style Hitchcock in that film is only in the sequence when Mrs. Danvers shows the, um, uh, uh, Rebecca's room to Joan Fontaine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. For the rest of it, I know the plot and it's not interesting anymore. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who has a vision like Marty, to get other people, because you've got to get other people yeah, to do it with it, you, who it. are on the same frequency, who understand what you're looking for, who share the vision, and then can make it happen, that's priceless. Yeah, that's that really priceless. is, and that, that's the struggle, too. Because yeah. it is collaborative. If I could shoot it, and if I could edit it myself, and if I could write it, if I could act in it, fine, but I can't. You know? <laughs> so you need people who are like-minded in a way, or exploring certain areas that you want to go to, possibly, at a certain point in your life. Nero is standing at the bar with a cigarette, and he's looking at Manny, and he's going to kill him. And you know he's going to kill him. And Marty has this shot, and he gets closer and closer and closer, and Bob's eyes get more wolf-like. It was just the most terrifying picture. And as I'm typing that stuff, because I'm the typist, he says, put in cream, put in cream. I said, what cream? He says, just write, ta write down cream. I said, What's, what cream? Who are you talking about? Just put it, just put it, put it, put it. Do me a favor, just put it. So I typed in cream. Well, it turns out, while we're typing that scene, he's already listening to the music. There, were, there, there was no tradition of reading in the house, no books. Um, of course, all et cetera, books in school and that sort of thing. But there, it was more of a visual tradition, more uh, if uh, I was taken to movie theaters a lot. Uh, also, being a sickly child uh, with a very severe asthma, I couldn't play sports. So again, the movie theater, the movie theater and the church, the church and the movie theater. and so. Along with the films, uh, there was also the advent of television, 1948-49, and the heyday of really the best, some of the best programming in American television, in the history of uh, American television up to this point with the 50s, 1950s. And so I saw a lot of uh, television shows, but also uh, films on television. Uh, being working class family too, they didn't have enough money to go to the theater, so theater wasn't an option. Um, live stage shows. So it was mainly, mainly, uh, um, visual literacy what was, was what was happening at, at that time to me. I did not understand that, that that was happening. What it made me realize was that there was an intelligence, another kind of intelligence, that was trying to tell a story through where the director, the writer, and the cinematographer 
where they were focusing your eyes. You know, whether it was a, the camera may be on an extremely low angle, looking up at you. Um, uh, the use of the lens, the size of the lens, and began to understand certain lenses did, did interpreted the story differently. Uh, a longer lens crushed everything together and made it flat. A wider lens stretched everything and some don't distorted it, especially if camera movement. I learned looking at certain pictures, particularly Wells' films and, and William Wyler, too, a wide angle lens. Although Wyler, Wyler used his wide angle lens in a very strong, steady image. But Wells used that wide angle lens, 18 millimeter it turns out, uh, and, uh, very often, to move along the walls, move along, and you really felt, I felt as if the camera was flying, as if the story was flying by, you know. Um, I didn't know why until I kept seeing the films again and again, and as I began to know a little more about what filmmaking was like and what cameras did, and, uh, and that's, I still didn't know who made the pictures, you know, uh, but I was beginning to understand that um, uh, there are certain um, certain tools you use, and those tools uh, become part of a vocabulary that's just as valid as that vocabulary that, that is used in literature, in our language. What is it about this thing of filmmaking that turns you most? What is it about this process um, that, you know, is it the editing? Is it creating the scene? For me, for me, if... First of all, you need you need the story. You need the script Find to be the there. You need the script to be right. there. You need it to be on the page in terms of the emotion, and in terms of uh, something with which the audience can empathize. In terms of characters, you need the audience to care about somebody. Okay, that's one thing. So we've been taking over the years. We've been pushing we've been pushing the envelope on that though over the years with Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and uh, particularly Raging Bull, and even uh, Goodfellas and uh, Casino. So we're pushing the edge there. How much can you care for a person if he's this bad or if she's that bad, you know? And can you still care? There's some yeah. out there I know can still care, so that's pretty good, okay. Now, let's see if we can push a little more. I have to like the people in the film. I have to love them. The characters yeah, or the actors? The characters. Both. Yeah, both, actually. Yeah. yeah. Both. First, I start with the characters. And um, if you have actors who are, who are soulmates, too, that's great. Also, I have the same philosophy, too. Uh, De Niro has a certain philosophy, Keitel. Uh, and it's the same philosophy you have? It's yes, a shared philosophy? Yeah, yeah, it is. Which is? Well, dealing with the subject matter that we see it a certain way. And there's a certain truth that we try to get to. Uh, Joe Pesci, too, has that about, the, about a raging bull or about, uh, about a Goodfellas or a casino. Uh, that uh, we just sense when something isn't quite right. We know that that gesture is wrong, you know. Uh, you can't direct it. They have, to, they have to be it. People who are flawed, people like ourselves... Uh, and to see if anybody else cares about them. Yeah. The violence that I, that I have in my pictures, um, and again, you know, be self-criticized. People say, sure, you know, the kind of violence you do, you think is all right. But if anybody else does it, you're, you're, you're criticizing them. But what we're talking about, the violence in my films, is not pleasant. You, you reap what you sow in the, in the stories I'm trying to tell. And I don't know any other way to show it. And, and, and there's also to deal with the very, very dangerous aspect of um, that, uh, that adrenaline one has is young, that, that uh, could be, uh, uh, could be um, uh, expressed many different ways, uh, and, and <laughs> some sort of excitement, whether it's sexual excitement or violence or whatever. There's that, there's that danger that one has to know. That's part of what it is being human, especially young. And that could go wrong. And when it goes wrong, this could happen. Now, the world I came from, the world I knew, or aspects I should say of the world I knew, it was, was a valid form of expression. That's the world I'm, 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 uh, that's the world I'm, that's the human condition. That is the human condition and it's tragic. And, and it's, it's set up in such a way that will, it will do us in as a species if we don't learn about it. I don't put it up there for people to enjoy it, you know. And if they are enjoying it, they catch themselves enjoying it and the characters pay for it. I love to watch my son direct. Raging Bull is one of the greatest I'll tell you what I don't I like. like. I don't like when he puts me in a picture and then he takes me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, That's not you know, fair. The whole, the whole scene in King of Comedy with uh, De Niro down in the yep. basement mm -hmm. his mother arguing with him is all improvised between the two very, of them. Very, very good. I, I thought of that all myself. <laughs> all did. by myself. And uh, I tell you... He gave me two words and he says, continue. Yeah, right. She wrote, a, wrote down her own dialogue. Oh, when he was... Wait a minute. When he, when, when he started, when he started with these films and he used to tell me... You have to get in the picture. I, I used to tell him, 
but I'm not an actress, he used to say to me. But you don't have to be an actress. I said, but I don't know how to act. He says, mother, you either get in the picture or you pay. Money I didn't have, so I had to get in the picture. <laughs> pay for what? For the actress. For the actor. Had no money. For the actor. We had to pay. We had, to pay. We had, to pay. We had no money. We had no money, so I had to get we in the picture. To so they had to use got. me. How much you got for your part? Mean Streets, they gave me $28, and I couldn't say nothing. $28. <laughs> These are the questions that you have to deal with if you're making a film to anyone who decides what you leave in the frame and what you leave out. And that, that's the fundamental issue. Where do you put the camera? Which take do you use? Where do you, where do you cut or not cut? That's the basic question. Now, we come full circle to the Irishman, you know, working with the actors, trying to capture again kind of a beauty of movement, gesture, speech. A lot of the stuff I recall from my own life growing up um, and that I could really explore further with you know, incredible artists like Pacino and De Niro. Al Pacino and I, worked, this is the first time we worked together on this picture. And Bob and I returned to working together again after, I think the last picture we worked on together was uh, Casino, 1995. So this took a long time to find the right project and to uh, find the right space, so to speak in which we could operate and also try to learn more about ourselves, I guess. I'm not sure. And maybe about making a movie, you know. And we're looking even more closely from this vantage point in our lives at the age of 75, 76. We're looking at friendship, betrayal, power, trust, self-preservation, and then maybe uh, the possibility of a redemption. I think I know, at least in my case, we all return to what obsesses us, what haunts us, to the questions that deepen and really become more mysterious as time goes by as we ask them.